the location here is so special. Just the, the nature, the people, the history, the, all of it coming together. It is a really unique place like Chernozem, like Poltava and Cherkasy Chernozem. Welcome to Storytelling Ukraine, the podcast of amazing stories. Please make sure to stay with us as long as it takes, because the best stories are told when the guests are about to leave. And I'm very happy that today we have with us uh, Helen Garbus. Hello, Helen. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for finding the time uh, to do this podcast. And um, it's, it's called Storytelling Ukraine, right? So we're telling uh, Ukraine through personal stories. And uh, I'm sure that you've got a lot of these stories to share. But before we get to the stories themselves, let's create some background, right? Some setting. So how did it happen that you actually have a Ukraine story to share? Hey. Um, <coughs> as a junior in university in the United States, I went to Russia on an exchange program. I was studying Russian language and Russian literature. Uh, so it did fit in with my degree program, um, but it changed my life, um, completely opened up my horizons, made me look at the U.S. completely differently. And also, when I returned, I was restless. I did not want to stay in the U.S. I did not feel like that was where I needed to be. Um, I was very interested in the whole idea of exchange experiences, so I did want to work for organizations who promoted educational exchange, I worked for a year in D.C. for such an organization, but uh, that was very administrative. I saw the field staff. I knew that was where I wanted to go. So I started applying to jobs. My desire was to return to Russia, but I applied everywhere. Um, and I ended up coming to Ukraine, but for a professional development exchange program okay. first on a one-year contract. So that is how I ended up in Ukraine in 1998. 1998. Yes. And you've lived here ever since. Ever since. Beautiful. <laughs> so, tons of stories. Uh, and when you come back to the United States or, you know, visit your family, talk to some friends from the States, uh, and they want to know what Ukraine is like. So, uh, what are some of the like, typical stories that you share with them to let them understand, like, what Ukraine uh, is about, if, if there are any such specific stories. That is a hard question because so many of my friends and family have actually visited mm -hmm. me in Ukraine. Um, mm -hmm. But so my family, my extended family lives in northern Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a lot of parallels between living in a small town in northern Wisconsin and my husband who grew up in a small town in Ukraine. So very outdoorsy, fishing you know, camping, hiking, uh, doing grilling, you know, the whole love of nature. Right. It's all very similar. So I think that's often my starting point is that mm -hmm. it's, it's not very unlike my family mm -hmm. to begin with. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. But um, let's say that for some reason uh, you would have to leave Ukraine. What would be the things that you would like to take over with you? Mm, things I can't. <laughs> okay. I have a dacha. Okay. It is my piece of paradise. It is my favorite place on the planet. And I have 88 fruit trees. Oh. And I cannot take those back <laughs> with me. <laughs> but they are, they are very dear to me. And whenever I go to the dacha, um, my first, the first few hours, I walk up and down the orchard and just check on my trees. So mm. um, obviously, my pets would want to come. Um, I, my friends, <laughs> things that you can't take. I mean, so, you can't you can't take Ukraine with you. It's, you well, I mean, in spirit you can, but mm -hmm. but uh, it's the whole place. It's mm -hmm. it's, it's hard. <laughs> you mentioned spirit, uh, and since you came here in 1998, you witnessed and you participated, I assume, in both Ukrainian revolutions, the Orange Revolution and the Revolution of Kidnet, uh, Dignity. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, what about the spirit in 2004 and then 2013-14? Uh, I think um, you mean comparing the comparing. Act, this, this, the two events and right. the, okay. Yes. Um, obviously, 2014 was bigger. Um, there were definitely <coughs> younger people involved. It was a more mature movement. Um, interestingly enough, my husband 
and, and myself to an extent were disappointed enough after the Orange Revolution that we weren't really the first people to get involved in the Revolution of Dignity because we were a little skeptical at first, right. having been burnt once. <laughs> right. Um, but eventually, yes, we were, we were part of it. My kuma, my uh, really close friend, who's my daughter's godmother, got me involved with uh, helping with some of the kitchens down there. And uh, my husband eventually got involved with the Kiev tent um, mm -hmm. and uh, with uh, bricks for taking up the bricks from the walkways to build barricades. And uh, definitely it was a, a different movement. It was, it was the real deal. Whereas real the deal. first one, I think, was, was sort of more of a student's, more of an immature movement, more of a, yeah. um, but it, uh, the stakes were higher. Uh, as we now know very well, yeah. the stakes were much higher. Um, and, oh, what else to say? I mean, both times, my initial thought was, I, this wouldn't happen in the U.S. I couldn't see, I couldn't see Americans doing it. Um, and both times, I was also very um, impressed at how Ukrainians could multitask, if you want mm -hmm. to say. I mean, and, and we did it too. We went to work and in the evening we went down there or, yeah. you know, uh, so, I mean, it was definitely, but, but this was big. I mean, people were multitasking. They were in their villages or their towns for a few days or a week and then they were coming to Kiev and then they were switching off and um, just the, the way the balls all stayed in the air and were juggled so well. And I, I just remember thinking this would never happen in the States. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> You mentioned that there was a sense of, sense of disappointment after the first revolution, the Orange Revolution. Uh, did you feel that sort of disappointment after the Revolution of Dignity? Well, as a Ukrainian, it's difficult for me to say because, okay. I mean, whoops, we gotta take that out, as an American. Um, that, we're not going to take it out right. because that's very good. That's very, like, <laughs> characteristic of how you feel now. <laughs> um, well, I'm neither. I'm, uh, my husband always says I am neither fish nor fowl. Okay. So I am no longer an American and I'm no longer, and I'm never Ukrainian, I'm not Ukrainian. But um, I never can be fully Ukrainian, but I am, uh, I am neither. Um, and it's hard for me to say because I am not, I do not participate politically. Uh, I cannot vote, you know, so I'm not a citizen. Right. Um, so in some ways, I, I often don't. I have probably already expressed more of my political views than I normally do because I usually stay on the sidelines of that. Um, I think there were definite expe expectations um, that we had and not all of them were met. Uh, my husband, at various times, as as the Ukrainian in the family, was probably disappointed. Um, but I think overall, no. I think overall things were moving in the right direction. Um, and I think the best evidence of that is the reaction of our neighbor. You know, they wouldn't have reacted that way exactly. if, if things weren't moving in the right direction. Um, but that's also part of democracy. I mean, there's, you're never going to be 100% satisfied. It's always a compromise. It's always a give and take. Right. Um, so in, in that respect, I mean, I'm, I'm glad the way Ukraine is going. And my, after the initial shock of February 2022, <laughs> uh, which none of us can ever forget, um, I actually was filled with a lot of optimism. I thought, okay, this is going to be hard. This is going to be awful. This is going to be painful. But this is, you know, but Ukraine is on the ascendancy. You know, we are, mm -hmm. this is it. We're, Ukraine mm -hmm. has a future. It's going to be glorious. We, we've yeah. basically reached the point where that was, I didn't doubt that. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I wish the future could come faster. <laughs> yeah, we all do. But yeah, yeah. but uh, would you say that we are basically across the point of no return, right? I think so. Excellent. I mean, I, I felt that. I, mm -hmm. I, I saw it in society. I mean, it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, anything is hard to maintain for a long time. Yeah. So yes, there will be some, again, compromises, stepping back, yeah. exhaustion. Yeah. Uh, but I, I do think there's, there's no way back. That's good. I, I feel and I think that too. Okay. My son was supposed to have a minor operation. At, we were supposed to be at the hospital at 7 in the morning. Uh, because it was uh, winter break for his, his private school. So that's why we had scheduled it then. So we had done all the pre-operation stuff the day before. We had gone to bed. Uh, we had set the alarm for 5 o'clock anyway, uh, because we needed to get to the hospital. But everyone was nervous anyway. Um, we had already partially packed go bags. 
and we had things we knew. Everyone had their job of if we had to, what, who was packing what. So, I mean, we did have a plan. We weren't completely unprepared. We had four, four 20 liter canisters of, of gas in the car. And, you know, we, we, we weren't unprepared, but we were not mentally there. We were mentally preparing for another very difficult thing, which would be an operation for our sons. So right. um, that, the fact that it had to start that day, I had, I had actually wanted to schedule the operation earlier because I was afraid of that happening. Uh, but because uh, my husband had had COVID a few weeks before then, they had pushed it back to, okay. to that date. So um, initially it was like, oh, of course it had to be today. <laughs> it was sort of my initial reaction. Yeah. Um, you know, we just, we followed our plan. We started, you know, I got everybody up. Ironically, I, I found out, we, we, we heard the sounds and we turned on the television, there was nothing. And it wasn't until my phone started lighting up with my cousins and my sister and my relatives and friends in the States sending me, oh gosh, they said it started, they're invading, they're, they're attacking you, what's going on? So I actually found out from the States first <laughs> that it had really honestly begun. Um, and my husband's cousin who had a friend in, in the military also called and said, yes, this is it, this is the time to go. So we packed up everything um, and we actually, I mean, we, we were very thorough in packing, so I wasn't like we left in 20 minutes or so. We left in probably about an hour and 40 minutes. But uh, we, were, we were still in downtown Kiev when the surgeon called, and he's like, so the um, anesthesiologist lives on the left bank. He's going to be a little late, but you guys can still come. And I was <laughs> like, no. <laughs> no offense, but no, we are, we are leaving. So right. um, we left, and we noticed everybody walking their dogs, people going to work, people going lines at the gas station. But it was a very surreal experience, uh, to say the least. Mm -hmm. And despite the plan, there were things I forgot, some important things. I also grabbed our expired passports so instead of the um, current ones, even though they were in perfect stacks, right, where I should be able to even easily grab them. Um, so uh, my sister called. She said, I, couldn't, I can't sleep anyway until you're out of the city. I'm going to stay on the phone with you as, as you're exiting the city. So we were, it didn't take that long. I think by 9 o'clock we were already out of, out of town. There were some, probably even earlier, there were some uh, traffic jams on the very edge. But for the most part, my husband did not want to take the quickest route. Mm -hmm. Because he, the, the quickest route is obviously the Jatomar Highway and that yes. way. And he did not want to go um, mm -hmm that close to the Belarusian border. So we left towards the south, and he had this whole plan of, of snaking his way through to Chernobyl. So that was our first destination, was the city of Chernobyl. Chernobyl, okay. Mm -hmm. And we reached it about 8 o'clock at night because of his, he took only tertiary roads. And, mm -hmm. um, but uh, we had some snacks that we took in the car, but we didn't stop. I mean, we were driving the whole time, so... Mm -hmm. um, his cousins who did leave within 20 minutes or so of their call, so they were probably on the road before six, um, they did go out the Shatomer, the shortest direction, and they did pass Russian tanks. So they didn't realize it until they were passed. And then they realized that what had happened. So mm -hmm. I think my husband chose the right route out. The right route out. And then you stayed in Ternopil for some time and... Uh, Just overnight. Overnight, okay. And we were trying to decide what to do. We already knew that men couldn't leave, but my husband wanted to take us to the border anyway. Um, we, um, his cousins actually were in the border area at midnight and were turned away. There were a couple cards from the actual border. So they also had to regroup and we decided to sort of rejoin and uh, together... Because of my passport mistake, our initial plan was to make our way to Budapest mm -hmm. uh, to friends there, but uh, the, um, the U.S. Uh, consular section recommended that we go to Shehini, where they had um, an American Welcome Center in, in Shemeshul, where they could give us, help us get uh, renewed passports, emergency passports. So we had that, headed that way and spent four days on the border. Four days on the border. Four days. Just like my in family. The car. Your family too? My family too. Same yes. border? Uh, not Shaheni, they went to Smilnica. Ah. Yeah. 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 But without With, you? Without me, obviously, okay. yes. I stayed, I stayed in one of Frankivsk. Yeah. So four, four days at the border. Yes. 
Uh, lots of people walking by with kids. Walking by, lots of foreigners. Uh, one of the saddest things was the, um, so you'd see people pulling wheeled suitcases. And then you'd see pu people pulling suitcases with one wheel. And then you'd see abandoned suitcases on the side of the road. And that was one of the sadder moments. Um, another moment was we saw some students, some obviously foreign students, and uh, they were walking. They had their bags on their heads and they were walking. And then they stopped one morning, they pulled out a bottle and they started brushing their teeth. And they're like, okay, so we got to be better about our own hygiene now because <laughs> we at least have a car. <laughs> um, yep. And uh, my, we were using, of course, the, the local woods. Um, and, uh, and my son was joking. He, he, was a, he was a Boy Scout, so he's like, we have to check for ticks. I'm like, in February? And lo and behold, he found a tick on my daughter's pant leg. So Ooh. clearly there were ticks in February. Ticks in February. Yes. And it was cold. It, it was cold, cold. Too. Yeah. And it started snowing on one of the last days yeah. that we were in line. Um, so we didn't expect that part. Our, our supplies dwindled quickly. And, but the local people brought soup and tea. And, you know, it was, we were, we were fine. <laughs> we have no complaints. It was, right. compared to what other people were doing, we were, we were fine. Yeah. Um, and then you fine. crossed the border and uh, you stayed uh, for some time abroad until coming back here, right? Yes, and the irony about crossing the border, so we reached the border on February 28th. And that was 18 years to the day that my husband and I had done the Zox. Because okay. we had separated our civil wedding ceremony from our religious one, you know, okay. the religious one in May. So it was very hard to say goodbye to him at that point. And, you know, not knowing what would happen in the future. And um, that was... That was very traumatic for all of us. And ironically, that was the, the 28th was also my husband's cousin's husband's boyfriend or birthday. Mm -hmm. So she ended up not being able to separate from her husband on his birthday. Mm. So after waiting for four days in line, they ended up deciding to stay together and find a place in the Carpathians to stay. So um, they turned around at the border with my husband. So. <laughs> But it was, uh, yeah, I, when I reached the other side, I was, it was sort of, now what? <laughs> the whole world had kind of yeah. changed. And so. Yeah. But after staying for a couple of months abroad, you decided to come back, yes? So what, what was the main reason for that decision? Not to stay in safety, but to go back to Ukraine? Well, by then, I mean, I knew it was a mistake almost immediately. Uh, by the time I reached my friends in, in Berlin, I... You know, my husband by that point had managed to get back to our, our dacha in the village, and the village was, uh, he wanted to go there first. That was his whole idea. But uh, I was nervous because it was on the other side of the Dnipro River. Okay, uh, and, left bank. Yes, and my family was very nervous, and I had promised them that I would make sure we would be safe. Um, and uh, they did actually reach about 50 kilometers from our dacha, but... Uh, You know, by the time, especially by the time they were turning back from the north and, you know, nothing ever happened in the village. So, you know, I kind of realized right away and I felt useless and I felt like I was sitting in this, you know, you know out of time, out of place, out of everything. And my, my children felt the same way, even though they had school to ground them. They had online school and they continued. And we actually stayed in Europe because of their online school, uh, as opposed to going in mid-year switching. Um, they wanted to see out there. Um, year gear with their classmates and um, it was it was obvious that we needed to get our family back together it was yeah. so you came back with the war still raging on and uh, we came back in July so in was, July the northern part of Ukraine had already calmed down so um, but yes we were here for the fall and the Electricity. And electricity and all the shutdowns and everything, all the missile attacks, like the one we had today. Yes. <laughs> yes, uh, right. Uh, so, for someone living in Ukraine, uh, the answer would be obvious, I guess. But uh, I hope that there will be someone watching us uh, who doesn't know what, what it means to live in a country which has an active war of aggression against it. So, 
In what way has your life changed when compared to the time before the war? Through my children, I can say that they have had to learn and come to terms with concepts I think that we probably never did until we were adults, and maybe some adults had never come to terms with. And that's the idea that, you know, the realization that life is dangerous and you don't control everything. And, you know, you may not be here tomorrow. And, and I think that's, uh, it sounds dramatic to say it that way, but that is a realization I think every single one of us had to come to terms with at some point, um, and the kids as well. And you sort of come to terms with it and you move on, but it's still always there. It's like a background hum. Mm. And I think, um, I mean, I think the whole experience, I mean, in many ways, I mean, I, I do feel like I went through or am still going through the stages of grief. I mean, I think we all are. We're grieving for what we had. We're grieving for what we planned. We're grieving for what we've maybe lost. We're grieving for our, our plan, you know, everything. And I, I think um, I think we all move through as a country, but also individually, everyone's moving through it at a different rate. So I think, um, I think there's just an unsettledness about life. I think it's harder to make plans, uh, future plans. Um, I think there's a conflict between needing to do what's right for yourself and, and wanting to help and, and feeling powerless and unable to help. Um, for me, you know, I'm still very devoted to my children and still, I'm still a stay-at-home mom. I'm still trying to get my children through school because that was, one, that was something that was very important to us. That was probably the main reason why we never even considered going back to the States is that we wanted me to be a, an integral part in raising our children. And, you know, so part of me feels, oh, I would love to just be able to go out and be there and actually help and hands-on, but I can't. And, you know, I think a lot of people have to accept that as well. We do what we do. We do what we can. Uh, we donate our, our produce to the armed forces through Magic Food Army, who uh, prepares meals for the Special Forces in Zaporizhia Oblast. Uh, we work with Always Faithful, which is a national organization. We, um, my husband went through his company, through ourselves, through our friends. We facilitate donations through our friends in, in, in the U.S. And we do all that, which everyone's doing, right? But it's, you know, sometimes you wish you could do more. Yeah. For sure. Um. When you talk to your friends and, and, and family from, from the United States, uh, do you get the impression that they also are getting tired of this war? And uh, what, is, what is their uh, perception of things? If, when you talk to them, is there something that, like, do you have to fight any stereotypes or do you have to explain them some things that seem obvious to you but have to be explained to someone who does not live here, does not experience all this? My family's kind of been here with me every step of the way. So I think my family really gets it. Mm -hmm. And I think they understand. And I don't think there's, I mean, of course we're tired. We're all tired. You know, we all want to go back to, you know, what does a human want? A human wants to live their life, right? I mean, that's what a person needs and wants. You know? So um, obviously there's tiredness there. But when it comes to maybe people who I don't know as well in the States, uh, some of my sister's neighbors or maybe some of uh, my maybe more distant relatives. Yes, there's, there is this idea of, well, you might, you know, despite the fact that it might be a, a bitter pill to swallow, you might have to accept loss of territory. You might have to accept that this is a new reality. You know, maybe at one point you're going to need to, to, to sue for peace and, and make these hard choices. And My general response is, okay, so if Mexico wanted Texas back, how would you feel? <laughs> you know? And exactly. I went to high school in Texas. So, you know, sometimes I'm saying that to people who actually live in Texas. So uh, I think um, that generally sort of changes their perception a little bit. Um, but I think it's not out of, I think they just don't understand the history. Um, And, you know, I didn't until I moved here either. I had one version of history. Right. Um, then when you actually are here and you realize, but even more important even than the historical background is 
the history of the last 30 years. I mean, the, things have moved and things have changed. And um, to me, I, I mean, it's, it's tiring, but to me, there's, it's, a, it's cut and dry. <laughs> yeah. Can't give up territory. <laughs> no, we can't. Um, I am actually very proud that when I was working on the Future Leaders Exchange program, the FSA Flex program, I am actually very proud to say that I went to every single Old List Center Mm -hmm. except for Luhansk, which I'm not proud of. I wish I'd been to Luhansk as well, but yeah. I never had the opportunity to. Mm -hmm. But I did have to have the opportunity to be everywhere else, and I have also been around Crimea, mm -hmm. and I have climbed Haverla, so I have seen a lot of Ukraine, and, and it's yeah. all Ukraine. <laughs> You've seen more Ukraine than I have. <laughs> Wonderful. And uh, the things that people tell about differences in Ukraine, obviously there are differences, but uh, what... When you were visiting all these different re regions, is there an, anything that really struck you that, okay, this is so different from, I don't know, the West, or this is so different from the East, or you would say that there are no such, such really striking differences? No, there are definitely, definitely differences. Mm -hmm. yes, that's... Um, and I love Western Ukraine. Um, it's uh, a lot of fun to visit, and I, you know, and, and it's, gorgeous and it has its own unique culture and um, but uh, and the East is different for sure but the East also has its own unique culture and, and its own traditions and um, our, our Dutch is in Poltava Oblast so we're sort of in the center and I, and I see a lot of the center so I see I see elements of both uh, around our village oh, hello <laughs> oh yeah that's uh... I have to have Mark Hamill. <laughs> okay, it's a good thing that we are in a basement, so we, ch we can just continue the podcast. We don't have to run to the shelter, we're sitting in one. Yeah, okay. Um, we knew they would be upset, so... Yes. <laughs> After yes. yesterday's After, good news. So. Yes, exactly. So Poltava is in the middle uh, and yes. it's... Um, I mean, obviously uh, Crimea has its, it's probably the most unique mm -hmm. uh, parts of, of, of uh, Ukraine's regions and has the most different culture. Um, and I, I was fortunate to explore it. I was also fortunate to work with a Tatar man for a little while. He was also a Flex alum, and he was working in, a, in, our, in American councils in our office for a little while, and, um, and was fortunate to sort of learn firsthand a little bit about what it's like to be part of that community. Um, but I, when I was running, um, the exchange program. I used to like to mix the groups for the pre-departure orientations. I used to like to make sure that I had East and West together. Um, actually, all East-West Center all together, so mm -hmm. that there was never uh, only from one region. And it was always interesting to see the students. They would start in their geographical groups, and they would even start speaking whatever language they were always used to speaking, um, even though they were supposed to speak English. Uh, but by the end of the four days, they were completely intermingled. Uh, they were speaking a mishmash of three languages. And, you know, it was always very interesting to see because, you know, when it all comes down to it, people are people, yeah. right? Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Speaking of people, like you lived in Russia for uh, some time as an exchange student, too. And if someone, I, don't, I really don't like questions, what if? But, just for the sake of it, what if someone had told you back then about what would happen like in that many years, would you have believed that? Would you have believed back in the 1990s that mm. Russia would attack Ukraine? Did you see it coming? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, I mean, Russia was still, there was still Chechnya going on, so there was still a lot of... Uh, a lot of just chaos in general, and even within the city, and you know, it was still very, um, very raw at the time, uh, very new, and they hadn't really figured out what direction they were going. And um, I was a starry-eyed student, you know. I fell upon the, I, you know, the idea of the end of history and all of that. As we talk about the academics, and you know, of course, to me, it was. This was it, right? This is we're all going to be friends now. <laughs> you know, yeah. There's no more, uh, no more of the per the previous conflict, and things are going to open up, and things are, 
they're going to develop and, you know, there'll be transitions, but there'll be in general positive transitions. Um, and I think, uh, I think a lot of people thought that way. Um, and I think a lot of people misunderstood the undercurrents. And I, I'm still to this day trying to understand it. And I, um, I do read things and I do think about it and I, and I, I try to understand it. But uh, yeah, I would never have thought hmm. at that point. And at that point, I hadn't even experienced Ukraine. So to me, it, you know, I wouldn't, um, the closest I came to it is a friend of mine in, in Russia had a stepfather who was from a village not too far from Kiev and told me stories about what it was like during World War II in his village and, um, and, 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 and so forth. But that, you know, and I always wanted to come to Kiev. I always wanted to see Kiev. I mean, of course, that was in my plans. Um, but I never thought I'd live here. Yeah. Um, so, but you came to Ukraine actually shortly after you left Russia, so in 1998. Uh, so, did you notice any differences right away, or it was like, Still, like post-Soviet thing. Uh, it was definitely post-Soviet. Still, okay. I mean, there, you, you can see those similarities. You could see the system, the crumbling system, was still there. Um, but people were very different. I mean, there's there's no comparison. They're completely different. Um, Ukrainians, in my experience, the Ukrainians I have met are all very open. They're very interested in learning. They're very interested in asking difficult questions, too. That, I mean, uh, and, and very interested in sharing what they have and what they know. And, I mean, anything from, you know, I, I mean, taxi drivers. And, of course, this was still in the late 90s. It was still sort of the gypsy cabs and not really organized taxi companies. So you never knew who you were in the car with. But, um, I mean, they would hear my accent and they would immediately start talking to me. And it was immediately this exchange. And... And as I said, they would, there would be piercing, difficult questions, but at the same time, a sharing. And they were always eager to share their views and, and you know, suggest things to me. And, you know, it was, it, it was very different because in, in Russia, it was very hard, even as a student. Uh, you know, we were separa separated with the foreign students went to, you know, lived in one part of the dorms or went to, and I lived in a host family too for a while. But, um You know, it was very, very difficult to, to make Russian friends, even as a student in university when I was, um, when I was there. But I, I came here on a one-year contract, and one of the principal reasons why I stayed and looked, and then that's when I found the job for FSA Flex, was that at the end of one year, I already had, you know, five, six people I considered friends, and I wanted to continue to live that life with my friends, so... Um, very, very different, very, very different atmosphere. Nice. Speaking of difficult questions, so what is one thing that the whole world gets wrong about Ukraine? Mm, that's a very difficult question. I know. I think it's the whole East and West divide. I'm really tired of hearing it. Um, I don't see it. Uh, as I, I mentioned, I don't remember if it was some part of the video yet or not, but I mentioned to you that my husband's family is from eastern Ukraine, from Kharkiv Oblast. Um, he is a Ru Russian-speaking family. Um, however, his father spoke Ukrainian, you know, as a child initially um, in the village. Um, but so my Ukrainian family is sort of based in, in eastern Ukraine. There's no doubt that they are Ukrainian. They've never doubted it. They've known they are Ukrainian. I mean, it... It's just not, I don't know. So I get very tired of it. And I also get tired of the whole, but Russian is, is um, less respected or Russian people, Russian-speaking Ukrainians don't have uh, the same opportunities. Um, I, I don't see that either. Um, and I see now, I see a genuine desire throughout the entire country. Because when I traveled with Flex, I heard a lot of Russian in Western Ukraine. I have to say that right away. Um, in fact... Even in Lviv, there's a lot of Russian. And I noticed a trend when I was interviewing candidates for the program that pretty much countrywide, if the, if the student was from the city, there was a good chance they'd speak Russian, with a few exceptions. Chernobyl and Ivana Frankivsk actually were exceptions. Um, but Lviv, surprisingly, there'd still be Russian you know, speaking. 
because um, we would give the students an option of what language to have their in in interview in. And in the East, it was the same thing. If they were from the cities, obviously Russian, but if they were from the villages, you'd get Ukrainian. Um, so I think it's, I think the West puts, that, that's, a, that's a Russian version of the story. Right. And I think the West needs to realize that, that that's really not the case. At least not that I saw. How about Ukrainians? What is one thing that Ukrainians get wrong about themselves? Something that I always got frustrated with, with Ukrainians, was when they would tell me about something I needed to go see. Um, I think the very first place was Rusanovka in Kiev. I think I had been in Kiev maybe a couple of days and a gypsy taxi driver told me, oh, you must go to Rusanovka. It's uh, the Kiev in Venice. <laughs> Um, I remember before going to Ternopil, one of my friends like, oh yes, this is, there are only two cities in Europe with, an, with a lake in it. This is Ukrainian Geneva. <laughs> no, it's Ternopil. It's Rusanovka. These are beautiful places in their own right. right. You know, and that's, I think, something that's always frustrated me. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Lviv is Lviv. You know, it's not... It's not an Lviv. Austrian version of, right. of it's not Vienna, right? I mean, it's 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 Lviv. The Carpathians are not Switzerland and Alps. No. no, and but they have their own unique identities, their own unique culture, and I think Ukrainians are beginning to realize that. Finally, uh, yes, <laughs> and 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 I'm not sure. It's not that they maybe didn't realize it. I think it might have been a shyness or not wanting to shout out that this is so amazing and but it is it is the the yeah. country is amazing there are have, have you ever been to Tarakan, uh, the Tarakanov yeah the fortress of Tarakanov no I haven't um I've been there twice and and it's been cleaned up a little bit but it's it, it is literally an abandoned fortress when you go there and and discover it it really is it's a it's unique it's amazing and it and it's not even that old it's from the late 19th century but it, it it's it's a you know, something that exists only here and only the history with the whole, with the Russian Empire, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, all of that, that's the whole reason why that exists there. And it's unique in and of yeah. itself. Yeah. So. so a bit more confidence. <laughs> and, yes. Uh, not comparing with others. Just You don't need to compare. <laughs> we don't. Lovely. You've shared so many stories. Uh, but is there like one that stands out without which like this whole story of Ukraine wouldn't be full, something that really comes to your mind, something very characteristic or very telling about Ukraine and your experience of Ukraine. Maybe in the first years, maybe, you know, during the war, something that, ah, this is Ukraine, right? Ukrainians are very creative. Um, they, I mean, the West has noticed this already with the ability to take Western uh, munitions and adapt it and even stick it on uh, old Soviet munitions. <laughs> and so Ukrainians are very adaptive and creative. And um, I used to joke when, so when I first moved here, there was still a lot of Zhihuly around and Ladas. And uh, I used to joke a friend, with a friend of mine, because when we were doing our flex traveling, we would take those old um, bazaar bags and, you know, we have tape, tape them up as they would break. And, and um, my uh, assistant was very good with scotch tape. I mean, everything, everything was held together with scotch tape. And we used to joke that the cars were held together with, <laughs> with scotch tape. And, um, some, of them, some of those cars were, really. <laughs> probably, yes. Um, I had a Moskvich, I know. <laughs> um, but my husband can create anything out of nothing. Um, you know, we, I mentioned we have a dacha. We do our own... Um, you know, uh, we have an irrigation system with these irrigation tapes, and he, you know, in in minutes he's created something to make it easier to to have the spool in something while you're pulling out the tape. So I mean, it's out of nothing, literally out of whatever garbage is in our barn, he can make something out of it, and and he's not the only one. I think uh, most people I know here can do that. Nice, so. nice creativity. Mm -hmm. That's the key word. If you were to write a book about Ukraine, and I guess you should, <laughs> listening to your stories, I think you really should. So what would be the title? Very interesting question. What would be the title? 
Well, we have spoken very little about my dacha. Um, but as I said, that is my piece of paradise. That is the one place that I want to be forever and ever. Um, it's the one place I feel truly alive and, um, and it's, it's Poltava Chernozem. And it is, everyone says, oh, you've, you're, you're such a good gardener. I used to sell organic produce among the expat community in, in Kiev that came from my dacha. No, I'm not a good gardener. I just have very, very, very good soil. And I don't know what the title of a book would be, but it would have to be something connected to that. Um, because that, um, the location here is so special. Just the, the nature, the people, the history, the, all of it coming together. It is a really unique place, like Chernozem, like Poltava and Cherkasy Chernozem. Mm. So unique like Chernozem. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well, and fruitful and, you know, yeah. um, creative, too, because you can create anything. You drop any seed in Chernozem and it will grow. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Oh. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. Thank you for sharing your stories. Thank you for coming to us. That was Thank a pleasure. And thank you so much for staying with us till the end. Uh, please support us on Patreon and buy me a coffee and all the links will be in the description. And remember, let's make this a world of stories and not of headlines. See you. <laughs>